A reading from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord. If you'll be so kind as to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the second epistle of Paul, the Apostle to Timothy, chapter 1, as we will take this time to look into verses 13 and 14. In the year 1877, Phillips Brooks delivered his lectures on preaching, and in his message, on the two elements in preaching, he said this, it is good to be a Herschel who describes the Son, but it is better to be a Prometheus who brings the Son's fire to earth. Now, when I first read that many years ago, uh, the book by Phillips Brooks, given to me by a, a good friend, a former alumni of Beeson Divinity School, a a friend who's gone on to be with the Lord, Sam Fitz. I read that and had no idea who was this Herschel. Uh, I would suspect many of you are thinking the same thing. You've got some vague recollection, Prometheus, somewhere in Greek mythology. Herschel was a famed astronomer just shy of Philip Brooks's days. He was the man who uh, hypothesized that the nebula are composed of stars He was the astronomer who actually discovered the planet Uranus, and he developed the theory of stellar stellar evolution. There was essentially no one else on planet Earth who could tell you more about the stars in the sky or our sun in particular than William Herschel. He was the expert. But Philip Brooks sets up for us this contrast, that it would be better to be this Greek titan Prometheus who defied the Olympian gods by taking fire out of the heavens and bringing it to undeveloped man. He said, which would we rather be, those who could stand around and in great sterility talk about Uh, the different combustions that are happening out there somewhere far away, or would you rather be this rugged, ragged Prometheus who dares against all, all powers of the earth, all powers of the universe, all powers of that false deity, and actually bring the fire in his belly right to humanity? I want to be Prometheus. I don't want to just be filled with the knowledge and absolutely void of the power. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, as Paul is writing what we have of his last letter, he begins with the normal greetings that we are accustomed to. He tells Timothy to not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or uh, of the prisoner Paul himself. And then there, two-thirds of the way through this first chapter as we have it, he says in verse 13, and I'll read from the New King James Version this morning, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. I would beg your a moment more with you if we might pause to pray specifically about this passage that God would be so kind once again to help us to understand it. Our Father, great and powerful as you are, we pray that you would once again Show us this great grace by allowing the Holy Spirit to illumine our minds to the truth of your word, 
to convict us where it is that we have not walked according to it and to empower and guide us that we might be faithful to you in these callings that you have placed on our lives. Lord, in simplicity, we ask that what we do not know that you would teach us, that what we do not have yet, you will equip us, and what we are not yet, that you would conform us, that we might be like Christ our Lord. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. The passage that we have before us is not technically necessarily a difficult one, but it is a relatively critical one. Today marks 38 years and three days since I preached my very first sermon. It was in 1986. It was just across town at at what was the old Roebuck Park Baptist Church, now relocated to Trustful North Park Baptist Church, where my father is still a member. He sends his greetings to you today. And I remember thinking two things on that morning in March of 86. One, what is my pastor thinking? And two, how is it that I can possibly do this? As a 16-year-old young man, I had, of course, uh, decided that I would preach from Hebrews chapter 11 on the subject of faith because, obviously, 16-year-old boys who live in the suburbs know all about faith, have got that subject down. And yet, Christ, He was, he was kind. I, I took to that pulpit that I saw my pastor, Doug Sager, take to so very often every Sunday morning, every Sunday night. And I remember it was just about the third sentence out of my mouth that there was just a holy confidence that rested upon my heart as if the Spirit just gently whispered, you are where I have assigned you to be. So preach my word. Over these number of years now, three decades married, a dozen years in Christian publishing, lots of years in vocational ministry of traditional churches, planting churches, starting campuses, uh, all it felt like I've been everywhere on the ecclesiological spectrum. I come back to a passage like this to remind you who are where I once sat, literally, normally right back there kind of in the sunshine, to say that there are these two commands in verses 13 and 14 for which I wish for you to cling to. The first found here at the beginning of verse 13, hold fast. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. It is no small thing for you to hold fast to the body of doctrine that is given to us in the precious pages of Scripture. It is no small thing. As someone who now works in the the space of commercial Bible publishing, this is what I get to do for a living. I wake up every day and get more Bibles into the world. Obviously, I'm a little biased. I want you to hold fast to the Bible, but not so that my bottom line will be better but because I have looked into the eyes of those parishioners in which you will stand in front of, into the eyes of those students in which you will teach, into the eyes of those community members of whom you hope to reach for the gospel, and it will require you to hold fast to this body of doctrine. And he says, hold fast to the pattern. I know that there are various ways that the English translations render this particular phrase in Scripture, I'll leave it for you, to, that are going to go to Greek class at some point this week with Dr. Thielman, who taught me, for you to dissect this passage a little bit more in your private devotions or in your academic pursuits. But there is this push in this, in this passage that is not that you would just cherry-pick little ideas that are easy to hold on to, but that you hold fast to the whole counsel of God. It guards us against the little pet theologies that will dominate your thinking and your ministries. And we all have them. 
those little ideas that we love to ruminate on, that we love to discuss and debate and talk about, uh, those one ideas, those doctrines that, that that one Sunday school class always, they're, they're perpetually always studying the 70 weeks. They're perpetually always studying how to have a better relationship. They're perpetually studying that one thing. And those one things are important. They are a part of the body of the doctrine that God has so graciously given to us to reveal to us who He is and who we are and how we might be reconciled unto Him. But they are not the only thing. They are but one thing. One beautiful color out of the prism of the revelation of God who is in heaven. Please dare not to be Herschel, who can talk about one particular way in which the chemicals react to each other and how beautiful that one spark is, but instead be Prometheus be daring to take fire into your breast and into your belly and into your arms and carry it lock, stock, and barrel, all of it feeling as if you're going to have your hair caught on fire, literally, because you've taken all of it to them. Andreas Kostenberg, when he was writing about this particular pericope, said regarding this particular verse that, that it's not just a matter of whether or not you can hold fast, but it also matters how. That faith in, and love in Christ Jesus are to be the trademark of how you hold fast. But instead, there is, it would seem, rewarded these days by social media algorithms that you be angry and contentious, and if I can just use a, a lay term, a jerk for Jesus, as if somehow his commission to us was go and win arguments among all the nations. How you hold to orthodoxy matters greatly. Now, I do desperately want to ask you today to lash yourself to the cross as if it were the only pillar in the world that can stand, because it is. I want you to hold fast to this full body of doctrine that is taught to you by godly men and women that has been passed down to us, just as Jude said that we are to contend for the faith given once to the saints, but that you do so with faith, confidence in its truthfulness, not confidence in your argumentativeness, not confidence in your intellect. And let me be clear, there are no wilting lilies of intellect that enter Beeson Divinity School. You are those who have decided a rigorous course of study is needed and necessary. You are willing to sharpen your minds, but do not use it as an instrument of warfare against fellow fallen, faltering humans that need the body of doctrine of God and His greatness handed to them with faith in the truthfulness of it rather than in the rancor of our own souls. But also, he says, in love. He says, hold fast to this pattern of sound words which you've heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. I must confess, I have preached some angry sermons and had some angry conversations with parishioners, with deacons, with leaders, with members. There have been times that those people have driven me mad, driven me to the brink, just as I have done to Christ. And I have to remember back to, again, these days around my Beeson years of men like Matthew Roscom and Sam Fitz and Doug Sager, my father, Phil Nation, professors that I and faculty members that I had here, Dr. George, Dr. Matthews, C. Richard Wells, Dr. Thielman, who very patiently put up with the contentiousness of what can arise in our youthfulness to say, but there is a beautiful body of doctrine for you to hold fast to with faith and love 
that you might carry it forth into this world in such a way that you do not use it as a bludgeoning instrument against the unbelievers, but that you use it rightfully as the sword of the Spirit in the spiritual realm against our spiritual enemies while rescuing those who are perishing, while taking up arms against the very gates of hell. Hold fast to this great doctrine in both faith and love that is found in Christ Jesus, that you would engage both your heart and your mind in such a way that it also not just reflects the truthfulness of who God is, but the heart of who God is. He says, hold fast. There is a second command then found in verse 14 that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Again, rendered in different ways by different English translations, I'll say that this second command is to guard. Hold fast and guard. Ensure that it's not damaged or worse, that it becomes lost. We live in a day as all Christians have lived in a day where it is possible for the Word of God to be misunderstood, misconstrued, misinterpreted intentionally, maliciously, and sometimes just ignorantly. You and I must hold fast to this good doctrine in our private life and in the very interior castle of our heart and how we treat those immediately around us as we minister but we must also be committed to guard this doctrine in the most public of ways. If we go back to the first epistle that that Paul writes to Timothy, he says there in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. He says, observe these things without any kind of prejudice, without any personal opinion that gets in the way of it. He says in chapter 6, verse 20, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge by professing it. Some have strayed concerning the faith. If And I appreciated the the very kind introduction given this morning about my life, my experience, my ministry, and this portion of my ministry that always seems to lean me toward mission. What is the mission of God? How do we live out the mission of God? How do we live as the ambassadors in our society and act as ambassadors for Christ no matter what culture we find ourselves no matter what ethnic group, nation, state we find ourselves in and amongst. You and I are called, as all saints of old have been, to guard the body of doctrine against the threats of that day and our day. I could rattle off a list of what I think are the highest threats uh, that I can perceive. Your list might differ a little bit. What I do know is that statistically it can be validated that currently if we just think about the population of our country, 332 million people, and currently 28% of our population are considered by statisticians as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, no religious affiliation. More than a quarter of our neighbors in our country just over the last 14 years, you would have been able to identify only eight states in the union that had a higher percentage of 35% that would say they are none. And yet that number grows and grows and grows. And the only places in the United States where there are lower popula- where there are lower percentages are North and South Dakota and where we sit now in the Deep South. We grow and increasingly not just post-Christian society, but post-religious society, where people don't even want to affiliate with anything whatsoever. And by that, it means that we will have to more ardently, carefully, lovingly guard the faith. 
The very nature of Jesus that was debated by the early church fathers and settled upon in the earliest church councils which you have studied and read about in your classroom settings. Those are the issues now up for debate again in our culture. Who really is Jesus? As a teenager in the 80s, I remember thinking, is there really body, anybody out there who is believing in the swoon theory that Jesus, when he was placed into the tomb, he was just in a coma and somehow unraveled all of the burial wrappings and pushed that two-ton ton stone out of the way and popped out like a goat, like Puxatawney Phil on... <laughs> no, surely nobody believed that. And yet now in this day and age, once again, the very nature of the Son of God is debated. The nature of salvation, if it's even needed, is debated. The very essence of what a human is. Are we born in a static state? Or can we simply by emotional choice choose who we might be? All of these once seemingly foundational ideas to the worldview of our culture have simply begun to crumble before us. When Jesus gave what we refer to as the great commandment in Matthew chapter 28, uh, it is the, the favored phrases of mission Sundays all across the world, go and make disciples of all nations. And we short shrift the commission there. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, essentially helping these that we've made disciples to publicly identify with the, to the world that they are a follower of Christ. And then the last portion gets completely obliterated from our memories, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. We are not just to hold fast and lash ourselves to it, but we are to guard it in such a way as you are going to be those out on the highways and the byways, in the churches, the universities, the divinity schools. You are going to be in the marketplace and in nonprofit organizations. You will be the ones who will be guarding the body of doctrine. So carry it forth with, with precise thinking, with sharpened minds, with tender hearts as you guard it by the very power of the Holy Spirit. I know that this message has included a few moments of reminiscing. I'll ask you for one more, and Dean Sweeney, if you'll just indulge me, of your predecessor, Dean Timothy George. Dr. George plays a very special role in my life. I got to tell him about that role a few years ago, exactly how much of an impact he had made in my life and, and his persistent friendship with me has made all the difference in the world for me in a, on a few occasions. But Timothy George embodies what I have spoken to you about in such a wonderful way, and I can illustrate it thusly. About two and a half years ago on the campus of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. David Dockery, the founder of the International Association of Christian Educators, was holding a meeting, and he asked Dr. George to come and speak. And at 10 a.m. that morning, on one part of the campus, Dr. George stood in front of university presidents and seminary presidents and provosts and the presidents of nonprofit organizations that were all dedicated to the education of Christians about uh, the gospel and, and the body of doctrine that, we, that, is, that is the Scriptures. And he used as his framework that morning, the consolation of philosophy by Boethius. I am not an expert on the consolation of philosophy by Boethius. I sat in that meeting once again enraptured and absolutely astounded at, at the absolute titan-like mind that Dr. George had. He used that framework of that book and wove in and out all of these biblical principles constantly quoting Scripture from one part of the canon to another to encourage these presidents and provosts and professors 
about how to educate the, the young and the old, how to continuously have them lean into a Christian worldview and a Christian thinking and a biblical understanding of all things. It was absolutely astounding at the intellectual depths that he took them to that day or heights or whichever part of the metaphor you'd like to use. That happened at 10 o'clock. At 10.50, the the session wrapped off, and he was whisked to the other side of campus where he was to deliver a sermon in Southwestern Chapel to the undergrad and the grad students, where then he spoke for 35 minutes this beautiful, soul-conforming and comforting devotional sermon expositing Psalm 77. And I went from these intellectual depths and rigor of uh, the consolation of philosophy by Boethius and how to build a biblical framework for Christian education to, to Dr. George just speaking tenderly like a grandfather to these 18 to 24-year-olds who were just trying to get through the next semester and needed the comfort and the care of a spiritual man who could say, and this is the depth of love that God has for you. And once again, he took us to a beautiful, rich, truthful depth of God and who he is. One, to presidents. Two, I suddenly felt like I was back sitting in one of these pews under his tutelage as just a youngster, learning from somebody whom I deeply desire to be like. All of this comes from a lifetime, a lifetime of dedication to the cross of Calvary, to the Lord who dies in our place, to the one who is risen from the dead, from the God of the universe who is willing to give to us every provision necessary for the ministry to which He is calling you, that He is going to make sure that there is a way. Bumpy may be the road, hard may be the times, and yet God will always be the one who is pulling the yoke as you walk along beside Him. You see, it is in this passage that these commands are accompanied with these promises. There is a call to exertion. Hold fast. Guard. But the commands like but they, they are called, though, also with, but you do so in the faith and love that is found in Christ. You guard by the ability that is found by the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And the Christian life, and the ministry in particular, is, is also a call to exert yourself. It is found all throughout the Scriptures. Commands like fear the Lord and serve Him in 1 Samuel 12, 24. Hold fast the confession of our hope in Hebrews 10, 23. Be steadfast, immovable, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be stewards that are required to be found faithful, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But you are not left to your own devices, and thank goodness we are not. For we should not be left in power. That is shown time and time again. But the faith and love we need to hold fast to the sound pattern of doctrine are found in Christ, not self-created and self-sustaining traits, but instead part of the sanctifying work of God that they are developed within us. Your faith will grow, your love will expand because of what Christ does. And the ability to guard this work is not done by the numerous books on your shelves It will not be done by how impressive your thesis might be. It it will not be done with perfect attendance. It will be done by the help of the Holy Spirit who guides us to understand Scripture and helps us in our weaknesses. And you and I, we are deeply weak. In Philippians chapter 2, a couple of verses that many of you will immediately be able to quote along with me in your mind. Verses 12 and 13, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Work it out as God is at work. That was the conclusion that the great Scottish expositor Alexander McLaren came to. 
after this soaring exposition that I read about this particular set of verses in Philippians, where McLaren goes this way and that way and absolutely expanded my mind in all sorts of ways of understanding what it looks like to work out our faith, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and awe of the God who is there because He is the one who is at work within us in our will and in our activity. McLaren ends his declaration and his exposition about it with just simply, work for God works in you. And in those days where ministry is harder than you thought it would be, and it will be, and your academic studies and your vocation as a professor is not as rewarding as you wanted it to be because of that one group of rabble-rousers who sits in the back of your class, that one set of guys that are the great unwashed, it feels like, In those moments when you are working for that ministry and there's not enough money in the budget fund to get the stuff done, remind yourself that there is no place for faltering in our private devotions or fear in our public ministry when we recognize the divine provisions that are granted to those of us who follow Christ. We do none of this to develop a personal platform for our own fame. We are but dust. Let me just say that as a publisher, you will be forgotten. It happens. You are going to be replaced. As a pastor, I've been replaced every place I've been. As an employee, I've been replaced everywhere I've been. But the legacy of holding fast to these good words and guarding this deposit placed within you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that is worth all of your time. Leonard Ravenhill, in his book, Why Revival Tarries, said, one of these days, Some simple soul will pick up the book of God, read it, and believe it, and then the rest of us will be embarrassed. Let me call you to stand in a long line with me of just a bunch of simple souls who decided to hold fast to these good words. Pray with me. Father, thank you that your mercies are new every morning, that your love is everlasting, and that your grace is sufficient. I would ask that you would be so kind to us to call us to yourself. Build our faith, deepen our love, and fill us with your Holy Spirit. For it is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.